My name is Cynthia Gordigiwa, and I'm ProPublica's Marketing Director. Welcome to What Georgia Needs to Know About Taxes in 2021. Tonight's event is sponsored by McKinsey and & Company and co-presented by ProPublica and Code for America. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. We're currently growing our coverage of the South, so it's great to be in conversation with Georgia tonight, as well as folks outside of Georgia, because I know there's some of you here as well, so hello and welcome. And Code for America is a civic tech organization that uses technology to design equitable government services. They operate GetYourRefund.org, a national coalition that provides free tax filing assistance to low-income families. Today, we'll talk about both our country's um, broader tax system and the tax filing process. And to help guide us through this, we are joined by uh, David Newville, who is the Senior Program Director of Tax Benefits at Code for America, where he oversees GetYourRefund.org, um, which I described earlier. David previously served as Vice President of Policy and Research at Prosperity Now, a nonprofit focused on building financial security for working families, as well as a Senior Policy Advisor at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Uh, Denise Eckley, is a career center manager at Goodwill Industries of the Southern Rivers based in Columbus, Georgia, um, which among other programs provides free tax services. In Denise's role, she oversees programs that provide access to resources, education, career information, and financial services. Um, and joining us shortly will also be joined by Elizabeth Mareska, who's a clinical professor of law at Fordham University. Oh, right on time. Oh. Well, she'll be back. Uh, but <laughs> Elizabeth Mareska is a clinical professor of law at Fordham University School of Law and the supervising attorney of the school's tax clinic. Uh, she specializes in federal law controversy and litigation against the IRS, and has advised clients, attorneys, and policymakers on tax issues which arise in consumer matters. Um, so thank you all for joining our panel tonight. One note uh, for the audience, this session is not designed to give advice about your personal tax or financial situation. Rather, it's intended to provide resources and information to, clar to clarify what's an often um, confusing tax filing system. Um, and also this session is being recorded and a link to the video will be emailed tomorrow with everyone who registered. Uh, but to kick us off tonight, we will first hear from ProPublica reporters who have reported extensively on the tax prep industry and the IRS. So to provide context about the systemic issues that can make taxes so complicated in the first place, we have a brief video that summarizes their findings um, across four key areas, it's about 10 minutes. Um, before I turn that video on, I wanted to um, ask our panelists if you could just turn your cameras off so that I can share my screen and you won't see anyone's face in the corner. Um, that's great. And I will uh, get the video queued up one moment. Hi, I'm Justin Elliott. I'm Paul Keel. And I'm Lydia DePillis. We're investigative reporters at ProPublica covering business, economics, and politics. We're here today to talk to you about tax filing services, the IRS, and what you can expect during this year's tax filing season. We'll talk about our reporting from the past several years on these issues, as well as information you need to know for this year. The modern history of how we do tax prep in the United States really begins uh, about two decades ago, uh, late 90s, early 2000s, or around the turn of the millennium. And that was a period in which uh, more and more Americans were getting personal computers, people were, uh, people were getting onto the internet, um, and uh, everyone at the time filed their taxes using paper forms. Um, but there, there were people inside the government who were uh, thinking a lot about the potential of the internet. Um, and there was a proposal actually during the early years of the George W. Bush administration um, to get the IRS to create a new uh, online electronic tax filing system. And the idea was 
This is going to be a free option that any taxpayer could use, uh, you know, made by the government, uh, an alternative to sending in the paper forms that everyone had been doing uh, for so many years. Um, Intuit, uh, the Silicon Valley company that uh, makes TurboTax, um, at that time already had a very lucrative business uh, selling TurboTax software. Um, and uh, immediately when the Bush administration put forth this proposal to have the IRS create a government uh, free tax filing system into it and the rest of the tax prep industry saw this as a potentially existential threat to uh, to their growing tax prep business. Uh, the companies uh, embarked upon a very aggressive lobbying campaign um, that was ultimately successful in beating back this uh, free IRS uh, tax filing proposal. Um, the way that they killed the proposal was they basically made a deal with the government. This was sort of uh, an early public-private partnership in technology. And the, this was, it was, it's called the free file deal. Um, and the basic deal going back to the early 2000s was the tax prep industry led by Intuit um, promised the government that they would offer uh, a free version of their software to most Americans. Um, and in exchange, the IRS had to promise never to create its own public uh, tax filing option. Um, this uh, free file option, as it's called, uh, was available to most Americans. But uh, the, the story of the 20 years since this deal was made is a story of the tax prep industry led by Intuit uh, taking steps to make sure as few Americans actually use this, this truly free option as possible. So uh, that's the history of sort of how we got to where we are today. The situation that Americans find themselves in today when it comes to tax prep is uh, if you go onto Google uh, and type in uh, file my taxes or file my taxes for free, um, you will be bombarded by advertisements from uh, Intuit for their product, TurboTax, from H&R Block, from uh, a whole host of other companies offering what are advertised as uh, quote unquote free tax filing options. Um, the fundamental trick that the industry has been playing on American tax filers for many years now is that there are two different uh, version, free versions of the software. And one is actually free and the other uh, often leads you to pay a fee. So uh, the truly free option uh, is called IRS Free File. Uh, it's a .gov website. Um, but uh, on the other hand, there's a whole host of commercial products. The biggest one is, is called TurboTax Free. Uh, which are actually very different than IRS free file. If you are one of the people who ends up clicking on a link for TurboTax free or H&R Block free, um, essentially what happens is uh, depending on your specific tax filing situation, if you have certain types of tax forms, certain types of income, for example, if you're, let's say an Uber driver and you have uh, 1099s that you get uh, as part of your uh, Uber income. Um, suddenly, if you are in TurboTax free version, um, after you've put in a lot of your information, you've, you've been uh, spending a lot of time with the software, uh, TurboTax will suddenly tell you, actually, to file this form, you have to upgrade to TurboTax Deluxe, which might cost $100. Or maybe you have to upgrade to an even more expensive version of the software. Um, and what we showed in our reporting was that uh, there's literally millions of Americans every year who are uh, getting caught by this fundamental trick where they're clicking on an ad or product that's labeled as free, but then they get three quarters of the way through the process and suddenly they realize they have to pay to finish. Uh, even though these same people, if they had just found the right IRS site, the free file site would have been able to file actually for free using basically the same software. Um, there was a inspector general report uh, that looked at, at this issue um, uh, after our reporting uh, a couple of years ago. And, and the inspector general uh, found that 14 million Americans in 2019 at least um, had paid for tax prep 
that they could have gotten for free through uh, the free file program. Um, so if you uh, if you're looking for the truly free tax prep option, uh, try to find the IRS free file version. It's you should start on a .gov site. So a lot of our reporting uh, for the last couple of years in the IRS is focused on the fact that the IRS has been starved of resources for the last 10 years, really. And it's not like it was drowning in resources before that started. So that what that means uh, for people is that basic things, like if you would try to contact the IRS, um, a lot of times uh, it's hard to even get through to talk to someone. Um, any correspondence of the mail is going to take months on end to resolve. Um, and what we found is that uh, a lot of the cuts that happened as a result of uh, basically budget cuts to the agency, they have lost a lot of personnel. Um, and it's been a different story how people have been affected depending on how much income they have. So people at the top of the income uh, ladder have really benefited from this because if the IRS is uh, short staffed, uh, what that means is a lot fewer audits are going to get done, um, particularly people who are upper income, because those sorts of audits are really resources intensive and take a really uh, skilled uh, agent to do them. Whereas people lower down the income scale often are really audited by computers. So uh, a computer might challenge, um, you know, someone's claim of a child on their tax return or ask them to prove up the fact that you know they said they made this much money uh you know freelancing or, or something like that um and so you get a letter in the mail and um it can be pretty intimidating to deal with um and then you have to deal also with the fact that the irs is short-staffed and it's hard to get answers for anything we found there's a real imbalance in the cuts the agencies who's been impacted by that so as Paul and Justin have probably already told you, after a decade of declining funding and staffing, the IRS was asked to do something in 2020 that was unprecedented, probably in its history, which was during a pandemic, get stimulus checks out to 160 million Americans essentially overnight. And what the pandemic meant for the IRS was like many federal agencies, they had to shift to remote work as quickly as possible. And that meant shutting down many of their processing centers. But the way that I, the IRS still works, much of it is still on paper. And so you had mail coming into these processing centers, piling up in tractor trailers because nobody could get there to deal with it. And remember, the pandemic came in the middle of 2019 tax filing season. So if you filed a tax return by mail, you may not have heard back even yet. Um, and that causes a lot of trouble for people who normally depend on getting their dependable refunds back in a relatively prompt fashion. And then later on, it became important for stimulus checks. So, but let me go back to the summer and fall of 2020 when the IRS was trying to get stimulus checks to the people who really needed them the most. And often those were folks either without bank accounts or who hadn't ever filed taxes, at least recently. And those people all had to be asked to file a special form and reaching all of them was really difficult. So asking the IRS to cope with all of these changing uh, protocols with less money, less staff, uh, less processing centers open and no extra money to do all this outreach that they were being asked to do meant that inevitably there was going to end up being a cascade of problems that continue into 2021. Now they're being asked to do a second and third round of stimulus checks, which are getting progressively easier because they now know how to get the money out and how to find people. The IRS did get another one and a half billion dollars in the most recent stimulus bill, the American Rescue Plan, in order to try to modernize their systems and boost their staffing. But it's um, it's a paltry way to make up for uh, 10 years of declining funding, and it doesn't look like the problems are going to get much better uh, just with that on an ongoing basis.
Okay, so we're back and the panelists, you can uh, turn your cameras back on. So I know that ended on kind of a bummer note, but don't despair. There are resources and information um, to help you navigate all of this. Um, for one, ProPublica has published a free tax guide that's full of free fact-checked tax information. And I'll drop a link to that in the chat box for everyone to have. But we also have this great panel here uh, to share this information. Um, and by the way, if you have a question for a panelist at any time, you can type it into the Q&A box. I see some of you already have at the bottom of your screen. And you've also received questions in advance that we'll get to. But first, I have a few questions to get us started. Um, so at ProPublica, we found um, that a lot of people don't know where to turn when they have questions about their taxes. In addition to the IRS free file system that the video discussed, what are some free tax prep options that you've had experience with? And David, we'll start with you for this one. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, <clears throat> and let me just say, it's great to be here uh, and partner with you all on behalf of Code for America and get this information out. Um, tax season is confusing uh, and can be intimidating normally, but this year in particular, both with the pandemic and all the changes to tax law that happened last year, uh, and this year uh, make it even more intimidating and more important to have resources like this out there for folks to get their uh, questions answered. So very happy to be here. Uh, in terms of free tax prep resources, there are a number of uh, very good free trustworthy sources uh, where you can get your taxes done. Uh, one of the main ones is the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, which can help folks who make under $57,000 a year roughly. And through Get Your Refund also, uh, you can access VITA services and other options and for anyone under $66,000 a year can access these services to get their taxes done. The IRS, um, the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, it's a, it's a joint program with the IRS uh, that's overseen by the IRS, but run by uh, nonprofits that do uh, tax prep with highly trained volunteers that, that show up every year. There's also uh, Tax Counseling for the Elderly or TCE, which specialize, specializes in helping older Americans, those 60 and older, um, who need help with their taxes, especially those with um, you know, particular issues around pensions and other issues that can be helpful there. Um, and then there's also a, a service called myfreetaxes.com run by United Way, which allows individuals to kind of do uh, taxes on their own to prepare them themselves, uh, DIY. Uh, and then as we heard in the video, there's also um, you know, the free file program, which can be a little more confusing as we know, um, based on the video, you know, depending on who the provider is, it's another public private service with the IRS, depending on uh, the private provider, tax prep provider can be confusing about eligibility levels, it roughly goes up to $72,000 a year, anyone under that can access it. But again, the complexity of your tax returns, all those other features can limit your access um, to that. So it can be a little bit confusing. And then the only other one I would uh, flag that doesn't really have an income limit, but is available to all Americans who uh, at least want to do their federal income taxes for free. There's a service also in the IRS can be confused with free file. It's called free fillable forms. It is basically like doing a paper tax form yourself if you're that adventurous person, but you can do it electronically. Um, which this year I would emphasize more than ever, you don't want to do a paper return, uh, as you mentioned, Cynthia, you know, because of the pandemic, there's such a backlog at the IRS being, you know, under-resourced and having to socially distance like all the rest of us, you know, um, uh, you know, who are able to do that through our work. So, you know, those folks, you know, to file for paper would greatly delay your returns this year, but you can go on and use free fillable forms as basically the 1040 tax form. Uh, but you can fill it in electronically and submit it electronically. But those, those, that's not an exhaustive list of all the options out there, but it kind of shows you a variety of uh, different services that are available. And I will say this too, you can go to both the IRS's website or to getyourrefund.org and use the VITA locator tool to find a VITA site that's near you. You can also access my free taxes through getyourrefund.org or use the getyourrefund.org service to be connected to a a local provider to do your taxes uh, at a distance to do it, to do it virtually and use the service that way. So those are some of the main options I would highlight. And did uh, Denise or, or Elizabeth want to add anything to that answer? The only thing I would add, thank you, Cynthia, is that there are still face-to-face -face options out there as well. It's not all virtual, but in most cases, you'll want to make an appointment because the socially distanced and uh, Sterilization of sites is still critical and we're keeping up with those sorts of things. And the app that David mentioned, IRS2Go, you can find where those locations are. Great. 
Okay, so with the pandemic, we saw, of course, widespread job losses and a spike in people filing for unemployment. And ProPublica, ProPublica gets a lot of questions about this. Just like generally, what are ways that unemployment insurance will affect people's taxes? Um, for example, do you have to pay taxes on it? What should people expect who are sort of in the system for the first time? And Denise, I'll throw this one to you. Thank you, Cynthia. So I think the really important thing when you look at this awesome question is the fact that the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 had a piece of it that allows for $10,200, the first $10,200 of your unemployment to not be taxed in 2020. And uh, you can actually go to see at the IRS website and other sites, if you Google it, lots of states have, have fallen suit and they're actually participating as well. The state of Georgia happens to be one of those states that is still taxable. So I know the big question is this, I've already filed, I had unemployment, what do I do? There are multiple, multiple news media releases as well as IRS releases stating do nothing at this time. There are lots of folks who are saying, but I need to file an amendment. I need to file an amendment. There's enough information out there to be dangerous. And the reality is until there is further guidance on what to do, don't do anything if you've already filed. The good news is if you haven't filed, things like tax layer, get your refund, other resources that are available for free have in fact been updated to take that into account. So that can be, that can occur as well. And should you choose the age old paper filing option, there's a form out there as well that the IRS has made available where you would do a calculation worksheet to show what you owe money on and what you don't owe money on. So remember, it's just the first 10,200. Okay, so what about people who took on gig work to replace lost income during COVID, um, like driving Uber, for example? How does that affect how their income is now classified for their taxes? And Elizabeth, can you take this one for us? Okay, hi everyone. Um, so if you get, um, if you work in a situation where you're not getting a W-2, you're considered to be self-employed. And when you, so you get a form that it might be a 1099 or something that looks like a 1099, it might say 1099 NEC, it might say 1099K, but that basically means you're self-employed. And when you're self-employed, it, it, it technically means you're carrying on your own trader business. So you have to file your own trader business return, which is what we call a Schedule C. So you have to file with your tax return a Schedule C, reporting that with what I'm going to call gross income, the amount you got, and then you're able to deduct expenses that you in, invested to make that income. So, and then when you file a Schedule C and you're self-employed, you're not only liable for income taxes, you're also liable for self-employment taxes, and that might be something you weren't aware of. Um, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So, if you're filing a Schedule C and you're an Uber driver, or maybe I'll use Lyft or DoorDash or something like that, one way you can um, determine what your expenses are, just use a mileage, mileage expense. If you go on irs.gov or really just Google what is the mileage deduction, um, you get, I haven't checked, I actually should have checked it, but it's, I think it's 54 cents a mile. Um, and you can deduct per mile, you know, let's say I do a thousand miles, you can take a mileage deduction of a thousand miles. And you can take that in lieu of actual expenses, um, which are usually harder to keep and harder to prove. Like how much gas did I use? And did I pay for any tolls? Or did I need a brake job using my car to be an Uber driver? So mileage replaces all of that. So you can take the mileage or you can take actual and mileage is easier. And generally it, it, you'll find it to be fair. Um, the other thing, so your gross income again is the amount that you received from this big employer. Now, the issues that I've seen with Uber and those other companies are that it's sometimes hard to figure out exactly how much money you got from them because they're reporting all sorts of different things. So if I use an Uber and I pay $27, the driver doesn't get $27. So you want to go back into your accounts and download your information about exactly how much you were paid for the jobs that you did. Um, and then you want to be careful that you're download, you know, they're getting the right information. Now, I would say five years ago, the information that we were getting from those companies was worse and now it's a little bit better and you should be able to get some kind of year end statement. Um, and you may also want to just check that with your bank deposits to make sure it's correct. 
the amount reported on some of the 1099s won't be the amount you got. It will be the amount that I paid to Uber. So you might see that $27 included in a 1099K filing, but maybe you only got 19 or maybe 12. And so you wanna make sure that you're accurately reporting what you received, not what Uber received. And if you report what Uber received, then you also have to deduct the amount that Uber took from that $27. So um, let me just keep going here with my notes, I'm sorry. Um, And again, um, I know it may seem weird to some of you, but you actually are considered to have a business and be self-employed. Um, if you have a home office, you can take a home office deduction and there is a simplified way to do that. Um, that is one of the things the IRS does like to audit. So um, in the past few years, they created like a simpler model to create, take the home office deduction. Um, and um, I don't know if anyone else wants to add anything about what kind of documents they should bring with them if they're going to Avida if they're self-employed. Putting anyone on the spot. Absolutely. I will I will say one of the most common things we see is a 1099 as an Uber driver, but no expenses. And so as uh, someone who has struggled to find employment goes out to be an Uber driver or an Uber Eats driver and doesn't have any tracking of mileage, any tracking of, of receipts for whether it's car repairs or other purchases that help to make your business more effective. So be sure to bring all of that information with you and to have it the first time. Um, we try to ask folks that information, but when you haven't kept it at all and you can't back up an audit, that it's important that you begin to do that quickly for, if, for 2021 if you haven't done it so far. Yes, let me just add, there's apps you can put right on your phone and you could like, it'll tell you how many miles you drove. And I think actually you can also often get that information from the company. So you want to be always tracking mileage. And if you haven't been doing it and um, you can start doing it now, certainly right now today, it's only March 29th. You can start doing it and have better records for 2021. And you should take a deduction. Um, and like I said, you could probably estimate those miles and figure out a way to come around to the number of those miles if you haven't been Great, thank you. Um, okay, so knowing your income is the first step to understanding how much one will be taxed. So could you walk us through just how tax brackets actually work? You know, we're just getting really general information here. We get a lot of very general questions. Um, and Denise, let's start with you. Absolutely. Tax brackets are so confusing. Um, there really are seven of them, and probably Elizabeth could answer these better than I, um, seven of them that affect your income, and they go all the way from 10% to 37%, depending on what your income is. The most common question is, is that my gross income or my taxable income, and how do I get to taxable income? So you actually are in a qualified tax bracket based on your taxable income. And one of the things that tends to happen is individuals because of overtime, unemployment, um, other, other, other dollars that may have come in, their, their income will go up, but they have not at the same rate increased their withholdings. So when you get to the end of the year and you're asking yourself, why do I owe more taxes this year? I got $6,000 back last year. Why am I only getting 600 this year? And really being able to look at that, there are lots of pieces and parts to that puzzle. And it can be a really confusing puzzle, which we've heard actually for the last 30 minutes, how confusing taxes can be. But there are things like, um, I maybe had a dependent that turned 17. So that changes my taxable income. No longer do I get 2000, but I get 500. Uh, of course, that will look different next year, but it's not a lot different if you have a 17 or 18 year old. Or um, maybe because lots of people didn't show up to work during the pandemic because kids were sent home quarantine, I now have a ton of overtime. And my I didn't increase my tax withholdings. And so now I'm looking at that and, and, you know, I've seen where individuals maybe had two thirds of an increase in their income, but their tax withholdings were the same or less than the prior year because of something that they didn't take a look at on their W-4. So making sure that you're looking at that as well. Um, another thing that could have an impact is um, 
is maybe you had a dependent, a grandchild that was on your income in the prior year, or you had a foster child, or you, um, of course, we know there were itemizations that changed over the last few years, and you haven't you haven't filed in a while. So, so those are all things that can impact your taxable income and easily increase your tax bracket when you're not looking. Great, thank you. Okay, so we understand that there are new rules for the earned income tax credit this year. So um, David, if you could tell us what are those new rules, but also like what is the earned income tax credit, who qualifies for it? And again, what are the new rules for it? Absolutely. Yeah, the earned income tax credit, it's, uh, it's one of the most impactful tax credits for, for working people. Uh, who are lower and moderate income. And, you know, there are some changes that took place this year. Um, and the American Rescue Plan in particular is going to change the earned income tax credit for next year when folks file. But for, you know, basically the way it works is as you, uh, as you earn money, earned income through, through work, it slowly kind of phases up um, and it kind of peaks and then it kind of phases out a little, uh, once you get to roughly a moderate income level. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, it's, if you have dependents, if you have children, um, you know, it, it can go up to a significant amount of money. The highest level of the earned income tax credit can be roughly around $6,600. And even for those who don't have dependents or aren't, um, don't have custody of children, you know, right now it goes up to roughly, you know, it can basically roughly be around $500. But the changes in the American Rescue Plan for next year are going to greatly increase that up to $1,500 approximately and more. Uh, give it a big boost, at least for one year, possibly longer if Congress takes action to do that. But the earned income tax credit, it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a greatly beneficial and highly impactful, you know, can add thousands of dollars to a family's um, tax refund. And the beauty about it too, is you, many people may have heard of the idea of like a refundable tax credit. Basically what that means is even if you don't have a tax liability, even if you don't owe the government any money to reduce your bill, like a tax credit normally would, you can still receive the money um, on top of it. Um, the biggest problem with the earned income tax credit, I think, for most folks is, you know, we've been talking about how complex taxes are. The earned income tax credit is, is uh, if not maybe not the most complex aspect of the tax code, but a very confusing one. And I think that's why there's a lot of issues where people file their taxes and they fail to claim it or they may improperly file it. So I think that's why it's um, particularly helpful to, to get help from a resource like a volunteer income tax assistance program when thinking about um, the earned income tax credit and making sure you take advantage of that, especially right now and next year in particular, when it really gets an even larger boost for those who are, um, again, like I said, those who are don't uh, have children or, or have sole custody of children, there'll be a big boost for the earned income tax credit next year. And last thing I would say too, is you know even before um, the pandemic hit with everything with tax benefits, you know, despite being a really impactful tax credit, about one out of five people, depending on which part of the country you're in, but roughly overall, fail to claim it. So it, it's it's a significant source of money out there. You know, over 20 million Americans normally receive it, but it's billions of dollars on the table across the country. So, you know, we definitely want to encourage folks to who are eligible to claim it because it's uh, it's money on the table for folks. Okay, thank you. So what if someone's having trouble with the IRS, um, like they can't get something sorted out or they're getting audited, kind of like um, reporter Paul Keel was speaking about earlier, what resources can people access for problems like this? And Elizabeth, I'll throw this one to you. Okay, the first thing is don't do nothing. It doesn't go away if you stick it between that place between the refrigerator and the wall. It doesn't magically disappear. So don't do nothing. It is scary. Nobody likes to get a letter from the IRS. I don't like to get letters from the IRS. And all I do is help people when they get letters from the IRS. So nobody likes to get one. Um, the first thing is, honestly, open the letter, read the letter. It'll have a deadline on it. And sometimes it's some, it can be something very straightforward. Um, and you may be able to handle it on your own. So you try to read the letter, look for the deadline. If you're gonna to respond to the letter on your own, never send originals, always make copies and always keep proof of mailing. Um, do it certified mail just in case you wanna make sure the IRS gets it. Let me tell you, the IRS will never call you on the phone and tell you that you're about to be arrested. They won't contact you by email. Um, they still use the good old fashioned United States Postal Service mail. Um, and if you get something by certified mail from the IRS, that means it's very serious and it has a very serious deadline and you really do need to deal with it. So 
um, like most of us, we get a letter from the IRS, we're scared, we don't know how to respond, we don't know what to do. The Vita site closed now because it's September, um, so you can't go back. They're still there, they will try to help you, but you can't go back there. Um, so Congress did another thing um, like a Vita site, and it's basically funded hundreds of low-income taxpayer clinics, they're called. So they're called low-income taxpayer clinics. Um, I run one, and our job is to help people with problems with the IRS. So you can go on the IRS website and look for a resource um, it's near you. If you live in a large state um, and there's not one close to you, a lot of people can help you just by mail or um, by telephone. So you don't have to be close enough to get to the office. Um, and what they will do is, what's great about the low-income taxpayer clinics is if they can't help you and represent you and do everything for you for the IRS, they will be able to tell you what you need to do to help yourself. Um, so do look for that resource resources. It is on the IRS website. Again, it's called um, the Low Income Taxpayer Clinics. It's um, underneath the Taxpayer Advocate Service part of the IRS website. But again, don't do nothing. Read the letter. If you think you can handle it on your own, make sure you have proof of mailing. Don't mail originals. The IRS will get back to you. Um, I think you probably heard at the beginning that they're very slow with dealing with mail right now. In some parts of the country, um, people are going in and out of the office. In some parts of the country, they're not going into the office. So things are very, things are very slow with the IRS in general. Um, they don't work on timeframes that make sense to regular people. Um, so things that you think might take a short amount of time could take up to six months or a year at the IRS, um, but now everything is even slower. So again, make sure that you have, um, if you if you need help, call a low-income taxpayer clinic. If you think you can do it on your own, make sure you do it by mail. You don't send originals and you keep proof of mailing. And then if worse comes to worse, really not hearing back, you can always reach out to the IRS Taxpayer Advocate Service and they can sort of see where your case is in the IRS. And they have ways if it's been sitting for a long time where they can help you expedite things. Great. So piggybacking off of that, um, you know, with regard to the backlog of paperwork at the IRS and the slowdowns, um, I mean, are you seeing delays in tax returns already? Um, what kind of time frame should people expect this year? Um, so Denise, what are you seeing? So never before have I felt like I couldn't really give a true average and trust it. Um, here in, in 2021, the IRS is still saying the average turnaround for an e-filed return is approximately 21 days. But remember that that's still going to be anywhere from two to four weeks, depending on how you count 21 days. What we are seeing and are seeing on a regular basis is that anyone who has had a rebate credit for the economic impact payment or stimulus as we commonly know it, is that there is a delay, particularly if you received one and not the other. The IRS is going to ask, why did we get that one to this family, but not get the second one to the family? What's changed? What's the situation? And they will investigate. It's not because they don't trust you. It's because they have to verify what happened to the money that they believe they already sent. And that is when we're seeing the most delays. Um, if, if, if there's anything at all that I can tell folks is to use the irs.gov website and look at where's my refund. So go to irs.gov, look at where's my refund. Equally, if you want to know where your stimulus is, go to irs.gov and they're both right there on the same page, where's my payment? So that you can take a look at that. And there are ways to look at how much they believe you received last year as well, not just how much you're getting this year. So that, that is, though I am also hearing the IRS say that they're struggling to open mail. If you, uh, if you don't have a direct deposit, you may want to consider getting a bank account. That's the other thing that could delay a refund is sending it in the mail, even though I know good old US mail is the way that they're doing things, as Elizabeth has already said. Um, when you receive a check, it's going to be six to eight weeks at a minimum, and that's without any questions along the way. Okay, so with that, we're gonna get into um, some questions from the audience now. Um, we're getting uh, several questions around the, the child tax credit. Um, so maybe first, if you could explain just what that is and 
you know, specifically, uh, we have a question here for families who just had a baby, like say in the past two weeks to a month, how will they benefit from the 2021 child tax credit? Um, can they still change their dependent information now to qualify for the payment this year? So David, can you tackle that one? Yeah, happy to Cynthia. So yeah, the child tax credit is another, uh, uh, it's another great tax credit for families. Um, it's undergone, it's extra confusing, I think, because not only was it changed uh, recent, very recently by the American uh, Rescue Plan, but then also back in the 2017, folks may remember the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, there was also some changes around um, the child tax credit. There are some expansions for both low, moderate income families and for higher income families. But basically it's, um, depending on your income, it can vary a little bit, but it's a pretty much a, it used to be a $2,000 credit roughly. And now it's been expanded through the American Rescue Plan to a $3,000 credit for older kids and for younger kids, six and below, it's a $3,600 credit. Um, and Congress has kind of, in the American Rescue Plan, layered on a new level to the child tax credit. Um, what it's done is it's decided to do, uh, ask the IRS to implement something called a, a monthly or periodic payment um, that is supposed to start in July. Although the IRS, as we have already heard, has a lot of different uh, pressures on it and pieces already. So it remains to be seen if it will be able to be implemented. But what's supposed to happen is if you filed a tax return, they're going to automatically enroll folks starting in July in monthly payments of this for half the credit because it's supposed to start in 2021, like the earned income tax credit expansion. And folks would, depending on the age of the child and the number of dependents, if you have one child, you get somewhere around $250 to $300 a month uh, on a periodic basis um, starting in July. So the details still need to be worked out. So we'll see what happens for that. But roughly, you know, this expansion of the child tax credit, folks may have heard this is, you know, supposed to cut child poverty in half because it went even further than the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act on the lower income half and made um, essentially the child tax credit fully refundable. And as I mentioned earlier, refundability just means you can receive a credit even if you have no tax liability. And in this case, you can have no income and you can still receive the, the full credit. So it's great for, for families and really low income families families with children and really low-income families to give them this benefit. Uh, but the details around this, uh, this periodic aspect and how it gets implemented remain to be seen. So we will see the, whatever happens with a periodic basis, you know, families will still be able to claim it next tax season, um, the expanded version of it, those who aren't eligible for it now. Um, and then, like I said, the IRS will have more announcements later this year, I'm assuming about this portal and how to register and do all that. If they do announce it, what I would encourage folks and as more details come out, there'll, there'll be an ability to go in and if you want to opt out, update your payment information, your address, I would just encourage people to keep all your information current. You know, if, if you have the custody of the child changes or you add a child to your household, just make sure you go to the IRS portal once that's established this summer or later and keep it current so your taxes you know, uh, there's no surprises for you next year. Thank you. So we're also unfortunately receiving a lot of questions about um, recent deaths in families. Um, you know, someone's spouse passed, passed away this year um, and they received life insurance. Is that money taxable? That's one of the questions we've just received. Uh, Denise, um, can you take that one for us, please? Um, it really depends on the situation, but yes, it's income, and it's it's uh, and the and the the one thing that that would be important as well. It depends on the timing of your family member's death, whether or not that individual has a final return tax return that needs to be filed as well. Um, I'm actually I know that there are lots of laws and lots of things that when we sit in a cer certain situation that may have impact. Um, Elizabeth, is there anything that I'm leaving out or that you would add? You were afraid I was going to ask you that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, generally life insurance is not a taxable, it's not taxable to you. Um, it's generally not taxable. There are certain situations where when it's payable to the deceased person, it's taxable, but that's rare. That's, I would, I would say, Denise, I think that that's, it, while it's true, it's more rare than the amount just going to the spouse. Um, so again, um, that's a great question that you might want to, um, so it depends on your circumstances, but yeah. generally, usually it's not taxable. Um, this might be a good point for me to bring up. If you do try to go out and hire a tax professional, 
um, you always want to be wary about, you know, who you're hiring and what they know and whether they're an expert or not. Um, and so the best way to hire professionals, like when you hire every any professional, is try to get a referral from friends or family or even your neighbors or your coworkers to someone that they know that they've used. And then, you know, just caveat emptor when you're talking to the person, beware, ask some questions. Make sure they've been around for a while. You don't want to hire the guy who pops up on the street corner and then closes down and never comes back. Um, and, um, you know, again, like I think, um, I know Vita sometimes is limited into what they're allowed to do when people come in. So um, this might not be an issue that they're even able to handle at a Vita site. So you may end up having to use a professional. Um, and let me just point out, someone made a question about those paid um, software programs, um, you know, those paid software programs can be really helpful, but you do have to put your information into them. So if, if you've got to a life insurance question, it's going to ask you a lot of questions and you have to make sure you're answering them correctly. And then usually if you answer the questions correctly, the program will get it correct. Okay. Um, our next question is, how are penalties calculated if the taxpayer owes a lot when filing their return? Is there a first time penalty waiver process? Um, I'm gonna throw that one to David. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer that one. And Elizabeth, maybe you know the better answer this one. I know that uh, one thing that there's a lot of confusion in particular around, and we get a lot of questions uh, at Get Your Refund about is around the EIPs and, you know, Will this be offset by government debts or private debts and so forth? Um, and unfortunately, the way that it went through Congress, it doesn't really help it very much because each of the EIPs, uh, uh, depending on how they went through, had different levels of protections. I think the second round of EIPs had the most protections from different types of garnishments or offsets. Uh, the first one, unfortunately, you know, uh, financial institutions could... Uh, uh, could take back uh, parts of it for overdraft fees or for other reasons. And then the third one round, again, they weren't able to do the same protections as they were for the second round because of the process that Congress used to pass the bill, the reconciliation process limited what they could include in there. So, you know, we still encourage, you know, a lot of folks are saying, should I file? You know, I know I have debts and all these different aspects. Is it still worth it? You know, uh, we still encourage folks to go ahead and do the filing process and go through it because for many, uh, many folks who haven't filed, especially if you haven't filed recently and given all the benefits that have come in through during the pandemic, through the CARES Act and through the American Rescue Plan, and then obviously through the second round of uh, stimulus payments, it can add up to be quite a lot of money and refunds for many folks. And it can still be worth it, even if there are certain off offsets that are involved there. Um, Elizabeth, I don't know if you have more to add or you can talk about, you know, yeah, if someone... so when you, yeah, yeah, when you owe taxes to the IRS, which sometimes happens, like Denise mentioned a situation where maybe, you know, you, you hadn't withheld properly. The first thing to do is always file, even though it says I'm going to owe taxes. And the second thing to do is you can set up a payment plan very easily at irs.gov. Um, and if you can't afford a payment plan, you can call and tell them I can't afford a payment plan um, because right now I'm not employed or my income is so limited, I can't afford to pay my rent and feed my kids and put a roof over my head. So if you owe money to the IRS and you can't afford to pay, you should call them up and tell them that and ask them for non-collectible status. If you can't afford to pay, you wanna always go online and the cheapest way to get a payment plan from the IRS because you have to allow to charge you for them is to go online and set one up um, with direct debit from your bank account. And as far as penalties go, the IRS is allowed to abate penalties. So if if you're not paying on time or you file late or you're paying late, the IRS is allowed under the law to assess penalties. In fact, it's required under the law to assess penalties. But there is something called the first time abatement program, which you can apply for through the website or by calling. And also, if it's not your first time, you might have special circumstances. Um, and you can still ask for the IRS to abate your penalties. And if you can explain to them why you weren't able to file on time or you weren't able to pay on time, they often can abate those penalties, um, especially if they're smaller amounts. So it never hurts to ask. There's a form called the Form 843. It's like a penalty abatement form. You can sort of explain your circumstances. You can also call. Um, I know it's really hard to get through. So when you do call the IRS, you have to be really patient. Um, sometimes they put you in a queue and then they hang up on you. Sometimes they won't even put you in the line because the line is so long. The best time to call is right when the hotline's open at 8 a.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time, I think they open. Um, 
So penalty abatement is a thing. Um, you always have to pay interest, um, but it actually is pretty low. So um, do again, don't ignore it. Try to get some kind of resolution from the IRS on your own through the website or by calling the number on the notice. Can I add a question to that, Elizabeth? When is it appropriate to go after an offer and compromise? Okay, so that's a really hard question because <laughs> it depends on people's circumstances. Um, but basically an offer and compromise, you know, when you're driving in your car, you probably hear these ads for like, save, pay pennies on the dollar for your taxes. And it all seems too good to be true. Um, probably because a lot of the times it is and they will charge you a lot to do your offer and compromise. Um, so if you want to do an offer compromise, one of the things you can do is look at the forms on the website. Um, they're actually on the website has like a um, like a calculator where you can put all your information in and see if you're a good candidate. Um, if you feel you're that's way above your um, sophistication, you can try a low income taxpayer clinic and they can either help you or maybe guide you through one. So offers and compromise are good for people who basically are in a financial situation where they're not able to meet their both, both most basic needs, um, and they don't have a lot of assets that the IRS would want to take, you know, would want them to, to pay for. Like, they have a really expensive car. The IRS might say, okay, well, that car's worth, you know, ten thousand dollars. So your offer and compromise has to be at least as much. They won't take your car, but they would want at least as much as your car is worth. So if you don't have a lot of assets and you're Income is barely meeting your monthly expenses. That's a good candidate for an offer and compromise. Great. Okay, our next question is about um, stimulus checks. So what happens if a person's income from last year is different from this year's? Just what are the requirements for the stimulus check? Is that going to sort of change their situation for eligibility, their, their um, income change? So Denise, I'm gonna throw this one to you. I honestly would have to, to look at the, the tax tables to see or the information that they have, have put out. You would have to have a significant change from last year to this year to be eligible last year and not eligible this year. Um, and honestly, that information as well is at irs.gov and you can find all the information for the first stimulus, the second stimulus, and now the third stimulus that tells you exactly what your income guidelines are and what the limitations are. I think one of the most, uh, the most considerable differences from one and two to three at this point is dependents and the age of dependents. So if you had a 17 year old and you had already filed your 2019 taxes, you were not eligible for stimulus one for your dependent. And you were not then eligible for the stimulus for a dependent 17 and up on the second one. However, this third one, no matter the age of your dependent, you're eligible. So there are some differences and some things that are confusing and there are nuances that, that really could be different for each individual. And I would just encourage you to look at irs.gov. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is about unemployment benefits. So for those who have already paid taxes on their unemployment benefits, how can they get those refunded? Um, anyone can jump in. It looks like Denise has some thoughts. Well, I think we actually talked a little bit about this earlier. The IRS has said, if you've already filed and you've paid taxes on that, um, well, the question, it depends on if you have filed or if you have not filed. If you paid taxes and you have not filed the, for instance, the tax layer program used by volunteer income tax assistance programs, it's been upgraded and you'll be able to have that $10,200 or whatever that amount is, it might only be $4,000 that becomes not taxable. If you have already filed, the IRS is urging you to do nothing yet until they get guidance out to tell you exactly what to do. Um, so uh, next question is about deductibles. So if you do not have a business, what items are still deductible? Um, are there home, business, medical things that people can still claim? Um, David, do you want to tackle that one? This is for not for business, but just a regular person who wants to deduct some things. Yeah, this might, Elizabeth might be able to give a more comprehensive answer here. But yeah, there's a variety of items that are deductible to your Texas. You know, it all depends. You know, a lot of it depends on kind of your, uh, your income level, like student loan interest can be deductible. Mortgage interest, if you own a house, can be deductible. Health expenses, uh, if you 
spend a certain amount. If you're willing to go ahead and itemize, you know, for some of these, you have to itemize and you have to go above the standard deduction, which is quite high in most cases, since it was expanded by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. But yeah, there are there are a variety of other things that are deductible that are outside of, of small business expenses for sure. Um, Elizabeth, did you have any anything to add to that? Um, no, I mean, um, a lot of the small ticket items that you used to be able to deduct in the past are not deductible anymore. Um, so any kind of employee expenses are not deductible. But basically like your home mortgage, your um, property taxes, medical expenses, but they do have to be quite high, like more than 10% of your gross income. Um, and then there's other things that like if you're a school teacher, you're allowed to deduct a little bit for um, supplies by um, everyone's allowed to take a charitable deduction up to $300. So there's a few things that are still sort of hanging around um, from the, you know, from the, from the tax act that they added in. Okay. So this next question is short. Uh, I'm going to throw it to Elizabeth. What if we didn't file last year? What advice do you have for these people? So if you didn't file and you need to file, you should file. Even though it's too late, you should still file. Um, and the reason why is you never want the IRS to file your return for you. And they eventually might get around to it. So you always want to file. Even if you get a letter from them, where's your return? Then you should go ahead and file. Now, if you didn't have any reason to file, if you had no money earned income at all, and you didn't have a job and you didn't work and you have no income, then you don't have to file. But if you have, um, usually I, I always want to say the ballpark is around $12,000. Or if you had a W-2 and you're entitled to get your refund, you should file. Um, you might be doing a refund, you should file and get it. And if you owe taxes again, you should still file. It's better to file and owe the taxes than to not file. So um, it's not too late. Um, it may be too late to electronically file and you may have to mail in a paper return. And I think we talked about at the beginning, it may take a while for the IRS to get to it, but they will get to it eventually and process it. Wow. Okay. Um, another stimulus check question. Can you still get a stimulus payment if you haven't yet filed 2019 taxes? So, so piggybacking off of that same problem. Um, yeah. David. yeah, I was going to say you can absolutely still uh, get your stimulus check. You know, the recovery rebate credit, which is the, the new credit that's been added to the tax form for this year, you can claim, you can still claim for the first one, you can still claim for the second one. Um, and the third one, even if you do, you haven't, people should, you know, obviously I think most folks would like their stimulus check sooner rather than later, but people shouldn't panic. Even if you don't get it this year, the IRS has made clear that you can still file for it three years out. That's another important thing to point out is if folks have been filed for a number of years, you can still file three years back. And even if you're below the 12,400 for a single person under 65, the minimum requirement for filing, you know, with the EIPs, I think even if you have lower income, you know, it doesn't hurt to file. Like again, even if you have offsets, there's a, there's so many tax benefits out there now. And, you know, many vital sites with capacity can file back taxes for you as well. Again, you know, if it's paper, it can take a while to receive it, but the checks can be quite substantial for folks, even with really low incomes, given all the EIPs. And if you have children too, with this new child tax credit benefit, you know, you're going to want to, uh, we're encouraging everyone to file a 2020 return if they can, because that's the main way going forward to either claim the prior um, stimulus payments or to access these new benefits. You know, it seems like the IRS, they had the non-filer portal that they opened up to allow people to access the, the first uh, EIP originally, and that's been shut down now. And it seems like everything has to go through a 2020 form, uh, tax form, full tax form at some point, at least right now, that could change. So we just wanna encourage everyone to file as much as possible so they could receive those benefits going forward and they're in the system. Okay. Well, that's actually our time for tonight. I wanted to remind everyone that this has been recorded and you'll receive, um, an email tomorrow with the video as well as some of the resources that were mentioned tonight. Um, thank you so much to our panelists for such an informative discussion and to our audience for your terrific questions. Um, again, look out for that email tomorrow. And from all of us at ProPublica and Code for America, thank you for joining us.